19. We don't have any citizen comment on agenda items, and I've been informed that we may have a staff report at the end. But Yeah, we'll give some yeah, updates at the end. So we're going to start out with um, Jefferson County Public Library and Rebecca Wynn. Are you going to be yes, talking to us? You. I also want to introduce, I have a meeting there. I'll be volunteer from our speaker um, bureau. Ma'am, can you talk into the microphone? Yes. Please. <laughs> hadn't had a mill levy increase for 29 years. We were falling behind in nearly every service measure. We'd had to reduce hours twice. We were in a very sorry state. But I'm happy to say now that um, the library is well on the road to recovery thanks to the passage of a mill levy in November of 2015. And so when we came out singing the blues, we thought we ought to come back and share with you how we're spending the money and what we're doing to restore library services. Um, we were so grateful for um, the support of the community, and I know you have a busy schedule, so I'm just going to, like, cut to the chase here. Before Jeffco voters approved a mill levy increase for the library in November of 2015, JCPL convened a Citizens Advisory Committee. We asked them what library services they wanted to see and what they'd be willing to pay for. The committee, made up of thought leaders from across the county, was unanimous in its feedback. After reviewing inputs from more than 5,000 Jeffco residents, they gave us a clear mandate for the future. Restore core services. They told us to provide more books and materials. Restore open hours. Update library technology. Catch up on delayed capital maintenance. And stabilize library finances. We know that vibrant communities need to have excellent libraries for success. Before the 09 recession, Jefferson County Public Library was a leader in library services. By 2015, after years of fiscal constraints, they had fallen behind in what was being offered to the public. We wanted to see services restored and return to their previous status and to be able to give our Jefferson County residents the resources they want and deserve. In 2016, we made great progress toward restoring core services. We nearly doubled our investment in books and materials. We bought more popular materials, including bestsellers, perennial favorites. We bought more children's materials, including picture books, and other early literacy resources. We offered new items too, including laptops and wireless hotspots for checkout. We bought more digital resources, like Consumer Reports, The New York Times, and Mango Languages, and even Lynda.com. And patrons love it. Lynda.com is an amazing resource for anyone who wants to learn all kinds of areas of software and digital media and marketing and art and I wanted access to lynda.com and I just couldn't afford it and as a teacher finding out that I can have free access and anyone in Jefferson County who has a library card can access it I was blown away I loved it I created my account immediately and I was just I was really jazzed to share it with my students like the very next day, I even sent out an email to all the staff in Jefferson County Public Schools. And I was like, guys, you got to check out lynda.com. They're doing a free account via the library. The library system is, is helping you out. As a result, people are borrowing more and more items from the library. In 2016, people borrowed nearly 8 million items, a 10% increase compared to last year. Another top priority was to restore service hours. In April, JCPL expanded service hours at all 10 libraries. Our larger libraries expanded from 51 hours a week to 65 hours per week. And our smaller libraries opened between 40 and 48 hours a week, making it much more convenient for Jeffco residents to get to the library. We added more story times, 
a program designed to help our youngest residents gain the skills they need to be ready to read. We added 30 new story times a week system-wide for a year-over-year -year increase of 15%. We also added more and better programs like 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten, a program to motivate parents to read 1,000 books to their preschoolers before they enter school. We held Raise a Reader events to introduce parents to countywide literacy resources. We introduced STEM Girls, a program designed to help girls excel in science, technology, engineering, and math. We expanded our teen coding camps to teach teens important job skills. And we piloted do-it-yourself labs at the Golden Library, where patrons can come learn how to use electronics, robotics, 3D printers, and more. We expanded our summer reading program, designed to keep kids reading over the summer. This year's program was an unqualified success. More than 36,500 people participated, and as a community, we read more than 27.5 million minutes. More importantly, 87% of parents and caregivers who participated reported that their child maintained or increased their reading skills. We also launched an innovative school contest with summer reading. Nearly 17,500 students participated and read more than 15 million minutes. Summer reading makes your summer fun. You can go everywhere in the whole wide world and never leave your house. And it helps you keep the reading level you had the year before. It helps you grow so that you're ready for the next grade. So you don't lose anything over the summer. I think that's really important that kids don't, um, don't lose what they got over the school year. And then it's just plain fun. As a result of these improvements, more and more people used the library in 2016. More than 2.7 million people visited our libraries for a year-over-year -year increase of 9%. And more than 230,000 residents attended programs, a 12% increase compared to 2015. We also worked hard to update technology. We installed more than 200 new computers, replaced outdated network equipment, upgraded servers, and expanded bandwidth across the system. Here, you can see the before and the after results of our server upgrades. More importantly, we provided better access to technology to patrons of all ages, and public computer use increased by 9%. We also worked to catch up on delayed capital maintenance budgeting more than two million dollars to repair and improve our facilities. 2016 projects included, among other things, landscape upgrades at all libraries, carpet repairs at Belmar, new windows at Wheat Ridge, a new boiler at Stanley Lake, and upgrading parking lots at the Lakewood Library and Library Service Center. We also began planning for a major update of the Columbine Library located on West Bowles Avenue. We got lots of community input and we can't wait to share the results with you. We also worked to stabilize and protect the library's finances. In 2016, the Library Board of Trustees adopted a number of policies to ensure responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollars. One states that the library should maintain a minimum fund balance equal to 25% of annual revenues and that the fund balance should never exceed 50% of revenues. We wanted to ensure that the library has sufficient savings to complete major capital projects and tide us over in case of emergencies or future economic downturns, while also ensuring that we're using taxpayer dollars efficiently and not saving more than we need. We are grateful to the voters for giving us a mill levy increase and giving us the resources we need to deliver a responsible level of library service. At the same time, we've promised voters that we will only ask for what we need. While we're allowed to ask for a maximum mill levy of 4.5 mills every year, there will likely be years when we won't need to levy the full amount. These policies will help to ensure that we keep that promise. 
Now the library is executing on its 2017 plan. We'll continue to add more resources. We'll continue to update library technology. You'll see new service kiosks shown here to make checking out materials faster and more efficient. More new computers. And we hope to add some special technology for patrons as well. We'll complete the Columbine remodel. And finally, we've been invited to partner with the City of Edgewater to put a new 10,000 square foot library in their new Civic Center, planned for opening in 2018. We've come a long way toward putting the library back on the path to excellence, but there's more to do, and we are absolutely committed to providing the residents of Jefferson County with the high quality amenities of a progressive modern library. I hope you'll come in and see the wonderful changes that are taking place. Very, very nice. You have really done a lot. Oh, yes. I tell you, it's so much more fun. I mean, we thought, oh boy, once the mill levy passes, maybe things will settle down. Well, no. They have just, uh, because there's so much pent up demand, uh, people are working really hard to bring the library back, but it's so much more fun to be able to say yes to things versus <laughs> cutting, cutting, cutting things. So we're just very grateful to our communities. We hope you're enjoying the changes that are taking place. Do you have any questions? Council? Con questions or congratulations? Or Thank you so much Thank for you inviting for us and letting us uh, crash the party. Quite a, quite a <laughs> eye opener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Now we're going to move to the Historical Society Agreement. Is Joyce here? Yep. yep. Ms. Manwaring? Oh, we do have someone. That's for the agenda item three from the Historical Society. I wasn't okay. sure about rules or what. Okay. Does she come up? She comes, yeah. she comes and All right, thank you everyone. Um, good evening, um, this is Janet White Bradford. She's the recently elected vice president of the Wheat Ridge Historical Society. So she's here to answer any questions that you might have and discuss the new agreement we're presenting tonight. So the history of this is agreement, uh, of this agreement, if you can remember back as far as last fall, um, September, uh, Jerry Dahl was contacted by the Wheat Ridge Historical Society to update an agreement that you have in your packet that's dated 78 and 87. So we were, we were very pleased to hear from them that they wanted to do that. And Jerry drafted a new agreement, wrote a memo, and presented it to you at that time. Uh, we went back to the Historical Society. They worked on that. We went through a couple of drafts, Jerry and I and um, the society until the final agreement was reached which is in your packet this evening. So the memo I wrote um, includes a lot of the same points that were in Jerry's memo. I, I wrote him and said may I plagiarize some of your memo for the new memo. So a lot of it is the same information and we can certainly ask any questions or I'd be glad, I'd be glad to go through this. There are three points I want to make that I think um, <clears throat> are worth mentioning separately. One, um, the first agreement that Jerry wrote, there was a lot of language about the post office building, which was originally located on 38th Avenue, and back in its day did not receive uh, city or I guess city council support to, for funding to move it off of 38th Avenue to the historic park. So 
the Historical Society got a grant and had it moved and it was placed on city property. So just to refresh your memory, the city owns all of the land and the property and the Baugh House and all the buildings except the post office. So during this um, conversation over the last few months to reach a final agreement, uh, the Historical Society agreed that it would be much simpler to just sell the post office to the city. So we have accomplished that. Um, they haven't gotten their check for $10 yet, Quite. but <laughs> we, we now own all the buildings, and that just helps simplify the agreement, the maintenance and everything we do, the insurance, so we don't have to kind of go back and forth about it. So uh, that's been completed, and uh, the agreement reflects that. And then the other item that's new, really, from the other two, and just to refresh your memory, one is for the Wheat Ridge Historic Park, and the other, we had a separate agreement for the Baugh House when that was purchased. So it combines those two agreements into one, and then the other point that's different, or the other two points that are different, is um, the Historical Society is struggling, really, to fund programs. Um, and we, they have submitted a budget. I've been working with them on a budget for the 2018 budget to help fund some programs, have a stronger partnership um, with programming, and just help support them to have a more active and robust program because they don't have any fun. You know, the fundraising just can't take care of it. So there's that. And then they are asking for a liaison uh, from city council to their organization. So I think with that, I'll just turn it over to Jerry. You have any other points well, that you'd like to make? We set the agreement up uh, to be in sort of three parts, obligations of the city, obligations of the historical society, and obligations of both parties. It's kind of a typical way to, to, uh, to do it, but the obligations kind of fell into those natural categories. Uh, some of them might, you might want to say ought to be in a different place, but they're all there, and that was kind of how we uh, organized it so that way as we go forward into the future we'll know sort of whose job it is to do what and uh, I think the prior agreements you know touched on that but but didn't really organize it in those categories and to me I think that's helpful uh, especially uh, because we've got two contracting parties you want to know who's what's on whose list so that's just organizational but I think it's it's um, it's helpful for that reason it does make the point that the city hires and pays for the one staffer uh, that's a city employee and ultimately subject to the to the direction personnel policies etc of uh, of Joyce and her department and it is not a historic society employee having said that uh, you'll see that there's language in the agreement that recognizes the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, job you know duty creation and and, and sort of day-to-day -day supervision of that em city employee that will, is, is taking place by the Historic Society. And that's a, a, a um, I won't call it a delicate balance, but it was important to, to, to describe both functions and to, to sort of draw the important line that, well, let's remember, this is in fact a city employee that's being loaned or that's being provided. Uh, and it makes good sense to have the Historic Society have a role in the job duties and day-to-day -day work of that person. The city itself isn't in the best position to do that, but it's a city employee. And so there's that, that balance. I won't call it attention. It's a balance that I think we've appropriately struck here, and that is language that we l worked at uh, pretty carefully. Good, mm -hmm. good. That's, that's really all I would have, uh, except if you have questions. Would you like to say anything more? Um, I feel that the partnership with the city is going to be very vital for helping the historic society to grow. Um, a lot of our members are getting a little bit older and I'm probably right at the moment one of the youngest members there and I'm really pushing to get more families involved and I really feel that um, with a little more support from the city I think we can grow it and let people know it's even there. A lot of people don't even know we have the all the artifacts and all the historical information that is is there at the historic park many people don't even know it's there 
And the post office is very vital to that. There's records in the post office that are one of a kind. So um, we really, really appreciate the opportunity to get closer to the city and be more active and getting out, getting out there that we're even there. <laughs> just had one last comment. I wanted to let you know that um, I'm going to be assigning a liaison, a staff liaison, one of the recreation supervisors that's also in charge of our marketing program and general programs to work cl more closely with the Historical Society on classes and just, you know, different programming uh, that we can provide, you know, together. And then I think his marketing skills will also uh, help. This is an addition, up. in addition to the one that you're looking for from City Council? Yes. Okay. More on the operational level with okay. classes for the activity guide, those kinds of things. So. I have two questions. Um, the post office, the, all the materials are in regard to Wheat Ridge or Jefferson County? Wheat Ridge. Everything there is direct. You know, there's everything. probably some Jefferson County information as well, but we really have tried to focus on Wheat Ridge information. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Arvada Historic Society just brought us over some things that were Wheat Ridge and not Arvada, so um, our focus is Wheat Ridge. There is many other places who do Jefferson County as a whole, but our focus is Wheat Ridge. Okay. Um, and then what would your hope that the liaison uh, would work with you? What hope would you have that duties of that liaison? The council liaison? Council liaison. The council liaison, well, um, to keep you informed as to some of the things happening at the historic park and to keep us informed of programs that might benefit us to be involved in. Um, I don't know how much crossing of the lines between different organizations happen. A, a tunnel. A lot. Good. Because, yeah. like, you know, local works, the historic society, the park, the rec center, there could be a lot more going on between the, all of these. You know, um, our focus is, is letting people know about the historic items that are there and letting people know about the history of Wheat Ridge. And a lot of that information is going to be dying off with some of the older members going on. And so we'd like more people to be involved and learn this stuff to pass it on. So um, I think the liaison is, is more or less gonna be able to help us get more involved with and be more interconnected. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor. First of all, I just want to thank you uh, to the uh, Parks and Rec Department and the Historical Society for working with the Wilmer Davis Girl Scout Troop on Arbor Day and allowing them to plant two apple trees on the property. And that was a great opportunity to teach the girls about uh, the importance of the historic property and the history of Wheat Ridge, but also uh, allow them to plant uh, two trees on that property that they can go back to as well over time and, and uh, care for. Um, in addition to that, uh, I, I was looking at uh, item B under the obligations of the Historic Society and it talked about uh, the restrict the use only to activities or events which are open to the general public, which uh, I think in, in general is a good policy, but as it relates to fundraising and the, the ability of the Historic Society to uh, fundraise, um, is there any instances when the historic park or the Baugh House would be uh, made available for private events or uh, fundraisers or the ability to use that for programming that isn't uh, generally open to the public or there's a cost to it so it isn't necessarily ac accessible to the general public per se but it, there's some sort of admission fee and so it isn't necessarily open to the general public, but there's some sort of barrier to entry, therefore uh, there's some sort of limited access. And so I'm, I'm curious uh, how that language there sort of limits that ability of either the Historic Society or others to do fundraising for the property in the future. And I want to make sure that we okay. kind of consider that moving forward and, and whether the city is managing those types of events or whether the Historic Society would have the ability to rent out that property and under the guise of fundraising for the historic society if sure. that were to come to fruition. I think that's a great idea and, and the purpose of this B was really so that there weren't private events that were not fundraisers being held by All folks. Our events are open to public. All our events are 
meetings and planning or you know, open to the public. Um, as far as like <coughs> the only thing we charge is if we off ask for a two dollar donation for the tour. But other than that, we don't have any. We've never rented out the property or anything of that nature that I'm aware of. We can set something up to make that happen. If you want it addressed in the agreement, I can switch that language or, or add some language to that to make sure it's Yeah, clear. I'm not interested in necessarily renting out the property to entities other than the Historical Society for fundraising purposes for the Historical Society, but I can see a situation where the Historical Society would want to do a fundraiser, and because it's a fundraiser, there would be a cost associated with that, and therefore, it isn't necessarily open to the general public at that point because I understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, th there's a barrier to entry. Is, you know, uh, is that um, as long as any member of the general public can pay, if they wish to pay, okay. uh, is, is yeah. admitted, then my take is that that's still open to the general public. Okay. The recreation center is open to the general public. Sure. Everybody pays okay. with some exceptions, but, but, you know, at different rates. So the fact that there is a cost doesn't, I think undercut that. I understand your concern. I think that they would need to make sure that that uh, that the public knows that if you pay whatever entrance fee there is for that one event, if that were even to take place, mm -hmm. that anyone can pay it. And uh, it but then I think you're fine, and, and the current language allows that. I think as long as uh, I guess the the intent of this is that. Uh, since there was a concern about fundraising for the historical site, and since this property is such a, a unique property, and uh, depending on the types of events that could be held there in the future, I can see, depending on the types of programming available, um, there could be a, an admission fee or other charge or opportunity that could uh, result in fundraising for the society, and I want to make sure that that's at least made available, not prohibited in any way, or saying, well, no, we can't do that because the contract doesn't allow for it. So we just at least make allowances for it at least. It, it certainly does allow, allow for it. Okay. Uh, what it prohibits would be a by invitation only kind of event, uh, or you know, a private private party, private wedding, that kind of thing. Without any revenue or charge for yeah. use of the facility. Yeah. That's what this is. Uh, you know, is Other questions, in. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Um, just curious, are we up to snuff on maintenance on the grounds and the buildings, or is there, are there any projects in the future that would like to be done or need to be done? Well, we're getting ready to paint the post office. Um, but basically. Cram in the windows, but yeah, I think, um, and, and we've set up a process for Janet to email our maintenance supervisor so that he, she can make those requests directly to him and then he can distribute the work, but I don't know of anything. The log cabin needs chinking. We have several, you know, small, small items. It's like been that ongoing and there's no gotchas that we need to address. Not that I'm okay. aware of. Do you have any, Janet, that we don't, I don't know about large um, items? No, we had a very little, we were very lucky in the hail damage department. Wondering. And we did have a little bit of hail problem on the Baugh house from what I understand, but I think your guys have already addressed it. Um, Jane hadn't really mentioned too much more on that, um, but I could double check with her on that. But other, yeah, we were very lucky with the hail storm. I guess. Ms. Davis. Um, I just wanted to say, and there might be other folks interested, but I would be interested in um, being liaison. in a liaison position. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Great. Ms. Wooden. I didn't have a question, I just have a comment that I'm so happy that we're moving forward with this. And I know one of our concerns last fall was the issue of some of the more senior members of the Historical Society and transferring that knowledge to other people. And so it, it sounds like that's all happening, which is great news. And that you do want to involve younger families, and we certainly need to think about that going forward, that how do we involve them and get schools and families locally interested in continuing the work of that. And I do look forward to you being part of the budget, because I think preserving the histor history of Wheat Ridge is important. And I do feel like the city should have some type of financial 
input into that because if we're going to value these buildings, then I do feel like that that should be part of our budget. So thank you for your work. Mr. Oh, other than Mr. Matthews. Uh, I just curious too. Uh, you, any long-range plans? Are you uh, like? Is, is there any expansion program? You know, in the future, or what's your long-range mission? I mean, are you, like, are you in the market for a barn <laughs> where we can keep a Shetland pony <laughs> or something? Just you know, any long-range expansion programs? I think that all the expansions that have happened at the historic park have happened because things came up, like the Johnson cabin got moved how many times before it ended up at the, at the property? The, uh, the post office, you know, they were gonna, I guess it was possibly going to be torn down and, and Claudia is like, no, that can't happen. So um, things have just been presented to us that needed to happen and that's, so, we don't really have any plans, but it seems like when something historic comes up, we're contacted and say, you know, hey, do you know about this? Or um, so, I, even like the Fruitdale School, Claudia and, and Charlotte were very involved in, in all of that going on. And because, uh, again, we have a historic partnership between the White family and the Fruitdale School. Um, she was one. Mrs. White was one of the first secretaries of the school. So things that, as far as long-term plans, whatever comes up, <laughs> historically. Yeah. Fitzgerald. I just had an idea. You're working on the Mayor's Matters now, aren't you right now? Yes. Uh, I wonder, why, why don't we, or maybe you could write an article. A feature. In, a feature right? That's a great idea. Um, especially asking for citizens to donate historical materials. That is in my blog every single month. <laughs> That's a great idea. Janice Smothers, you want to contact? Janice? Janice Smothers. Um, yeah. Mr. Urban. Thank you. To that end, I understand uh, uh, from Channel 7 that the uh, Everett home has uh, recently been put up for sale and there was some historic artifacts uh, related to that house, and I don't know what contact they've had with the Historic Society or otherwise, but um, maybe some contact there and some artifacts in that regard, but that may be a contact to make. Uh, I actually spoke with him Friday. He oh. me to verify some facts before he said anything on, on air. That's great. And, yes. I, I was just gonna ask a different question. Sure. Did you get to finish? Mm -hmm. um, as I recall, the buildings don't hold a lot of people. No, they don't. Okay. Most of our events are outside. Yeah. Um, because really, every one of the buildings is small. Um, even when we have school kids, we have had several different schools come by. And what we do is break them up into like groups of 10. And then we have different people at each of the buildings. And they go in and have a little, little tour of that. Right. Um, 10 people at a time is probably about the max in each building for a tour um, to even you know be able to move around so most most our three main events every year are outside mostly and then people can tour the properties just for those who are listening what are your three events our may festival every event we have is on the second saturday of the month our may festival uh, happened this year we had a dedication of the two trees that the girl scouts had planted for us earlier uh, dedicated the two trees at the May Festival, had a Maypole dance, and we always cook something on the old cook stove so people could see how difficult it was back in the day to put a meal out. And we um, do that every May, second Saturday in May. And then our next event will be Heritage Day, which is the same weekend this year as Carnation Festival. So after the highlight and excitement over at the Carnation Festival, families can come and wind down a little bit and see the historic park. And again, we have a luncheon um, at the Baugh House, which is right up at 44th and Rob. So it's right up on the main road. And we will have a quilt show at that event. And then our big event is the October Festival, the Cider Day, which is the second Saturday in October, where we bring out our cider presses and people can bring clean bottles and their apples um, for a small donation. They use our press to make apple cider. 
kids love to do it because they get to play with a crank and crank all that apples right. into cider. Um, we have, again, our, our lunch out of the Saudi and um, usually there are crafters doing demonstrations at that event as well. I'm amazed we, we really haven't publicized at all what, they, what they're doing. I'm very excited about you volunteering to do that. Um, these, these are some things that our citizens would really enjoy. Right, and I'm, I've been tasked with um, taking care of our, our website now, and I I'm put a blog on every month. Sometimes I add an extra one there and here and there. I put together some homemade signs to put out on the street so that people even know we're having an event that day. Right. Um, now, you don't mind if a thousand people come, though, right? <laughs> What's your last? Historicalsociety.org. Mr. Fitzgerald. This is another off-the-wall kind of thing. There are two properties between the Baugh House and the other part of the, the park. Have we ever considered trying to acquire those houses and connect the, the two parcels? We did. At one time, we had a list of properties. Uh, that we were interested in acquiring. It was when Jefferson County um, passed the bond issue for future acquisitions. We got into negotiations with the property due north of the Baugh House, but not successfully. And then um, we changed um, elected officials, and that interest in that list waned in terms of pursuing additional open space or additional park property. That was back in around 2000, between 2000 and 2004, I think. So we haven't pursued anything since then. Yes, but that was at one time a suggestion to connect the two. I believe there's no further, oh, our clerk would like to ask a question. Well, I could add something as far as immediate plans. One of the things was the water tower got donated and so that became a project. Um, there, there actually is a vision for the Ba property to have um, tall prairie grasses and a trail that goes through and um, so kids and even adults can um, experience what it was like to have tall prairie grasses. Tall prairie grasses are tall. Um, and, oh, the other thing, do you still have the um, antique appraisal? Well, unfortunately, we have had that in the past in May, and almost all the appraisers that they've worked with in the past are very busy in the spring, and so we were hoping to move it to um, to the apple cider days, to August, and um, and we just have not been able to find somebody to participate with us on that. But I'd like to bring that back in the future, if at all possible. But what we've done this year is we're just doing the quilt show, and then um, for the August event, and we always have musicians at our three main events as well. Uh, doing old time songs, and we have people come and join the musicians, so it's always very popular. Yeah, that antique appraisal was um, a very popular yeah, and a good fundraiser, too. You um, they had experts, and you could um, bring items from your house for five bucks a piece, they would tell you how much it what it was and how much it was worth, and and the historical society, you know. For them, it was yes, it, it was, was a good fundraiser. I think it's a good idea. It's kind of like a little Wheat Ridge Antiques Roadshow. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was a great idea, but like yeah. I say, the, the people that I've worked with in the past have just not been able to find somebody new. And uh, I'm gonna I'm actually starting now on getting that set up for next year. So. And they were like true appraisers, you know, like right. people who own antique stores on Broadway and stuff like that. They weren't just self-appointed appraisers. They were people that really knew. Right. Yeah. Extensive. I believe that's it. Thank you very much for coming. It was quite yeah. enjoyable. Thank you. And uh, I think we'll be hearing a little bit more from you. And so this is scheduled for next Monday's um, council agenda for formal adoption. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I believe we're close to the end, but I believe we're going to get a staff report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple quick updates. Um, I did have a chance to meet with um, a f um, one of the field, let's see, what was his title? Field observers or field staff from the Department of Homeland Security last week, um, last Tuesday. And um, they're doing an assessment um, from the storm, um, not just in Wheat Ridge, but um, kind of in the whole multiple county area that was um, affected by the storm. As I think you all know, Wheat Ridge was probably the, the hardest hit. Um, unfortunately, there is no federal um, declaration for assistance being offered um, or no individual assistance either. Um, however, they are the route that they're going down is looking for um, assistance from the Small Business Association to provide loans um, to businesses that potentially um, may have significant damage that they may need. Um, you know, they've been kind of canvassing Wheat Ridge and they've, they've talked to the Wheat Ridge um, Chamber and the, I think believe the Business Association and really haven't gotten too too much feedback from business um, districts or that um, there's significant damage that somebody might need a loan to keep their business in operation. Um, staff hasn't really heard of any business either that's been out of operation because of the storm. You all know of course the Colorado Mills was was the place that was hit the hardest and, and they're definitely out of business a lot of those those stores. So. Um, they, they, they believe if they can get the declaration from the Small Business Association, um, primarily because of the Colorado Mills Mall, it will apply to the whole storm area. And then any business that, that would like to apply for one of these um, loans, which I've been told are low interest and, and some good terms, um, they'll have that, that um, ability to do that. But um, So we, sh we should be getting a, a report back from um, Homeland Security, which I'll share with you um, in the next few days, hopefully. Um, and then just, just a quick update um, on kind of the, the permitting process and the storm damage in Wheat Ridge. Um, we, um, I don't have any specific stats on number of permits or revenues or expenditures, but I think we're going to provide another report in a week to you on that. But um, there's still a steady flow of applications for permits. So I authorized last week, I believe last Thursday or Friday, um, an, an additional, a third permit technician and a, a fifth um, building inspector. So the permit technician actually started today. So we have three full-time permit technicians on board. Um, so we're hoping that's going to help keep up with the, the backlog and, and um, hopefully um, um, stick to a, a kind of a window of, of, of um, time where we can actually respond to a, 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 an application. Um, we're hoping to do it in three to five days. Um, we're not able, we're not able to do that now, but with we believe with the new permit technician on as of today that we believe tomorrow, hopefully starting, we should be able to respond to permit applications within a three to five day window. Um, we're still meeting our next day inspections, um, and with the additional inspector, um, we hope that will help also. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be fully staffed the whole time. Some of these folks are have vacations planned and, and other issues, and um, most of these are contract employees, so they're coming from out of state. Um, some have to go home occasionally to do some family stuff. So um, the, the company that we're working with, though, our new contract um, building um, department contract company is, has been very, very helpful, um, very um, positive and helpful in, in bringing additional staff in um, to help us out. So. Um, we're hoping um, that we're going to keep caught up and uh, on that. So, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, happy to answer anything on that. Otherwise, that's all I got. Thank you. Any uh, council members would like to report on any of the outside committees to which they belong? Mr. Fitzgerald. I am council's uh, delegate to the housing authority and. Um, Homelessness and affordable housing is a problem for all of us right now. Uh, we, or, uh, the Denver metropolitan area is one of the most expensive uh, cities in the country that is not on water in order to live, and most of our average families cannot afford to buy a house, uh, or it's getting so they can't afford to rent a house either in this area. And the Wheat Ridge Housing Authority is out of money. Um, our, however, the federal government is in the process of uh, releasing funds um, 
to counties, and that's where the source of our funds come from, the CBDG funds and, and home funds. Um, two of our county commissioners are toying with the idea that um, using federal tax dollars uh, is a waste of uh, money for uh, localities. Um, so our county is considering not applying for our share of the funds. Uh, it's about a million dollars at stake here. Um, so if, we, if the county does not apply, we have zero chance of getting any money for the Housing Authority and, and other places that use, use those funds. If they do apply, there's no certainty that we'll get the money, but we can compete for it. Um, so on the 27th, Tuesday, at 8, 8 a.m., uh, the county commissioners will hold a meeting to decide whether or not to apply for these federal funds. And uh, if, if we don't apply for them, somebody else will get them. Some other county will get them, some other county will use them. Um, so the, the funds are there, uh, and it seems to me a real waste to not even apply for them. So I would uh, invite citizens who are watching and anybody here who's interested to attend the meeting at 8 a.m. in the Taj Mahal, uh, second floor, uh, to urge that the uh, commissioners apply for the funds. Thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. Um, I have written them protesting this, um, turning away these funds, as well as I plan to be at that meeting, and I'm hoping that I have some information I can share. A um, couple of the other mayors will be there as well, but uh, if anybody would like to come, it would be very helpful, especially for our city. Madam Mayor, um, as a commissioner for the Jefferson County Housing Authority, I have to agree with Councilmember Fitzgerald that the use of uh, home funds and CDBG funds in Jefferson County is an excellent tool to allow Jefferson County taxpayers to receive back funds that we have already uh, paid into the federal government and our ability to see reinvestment in our community from uh, tax dollars that we have paid to the federal coffers. And as I understand it, the pressures that have uh, come to the county commissioners to uh, shun these dollars aren't necessarily coming from Jefferson County residents, but are coming from individuals outside of Jefferson County and are coming from entities with interests outside of our uh, outside of our county with interests that may not necessarily align with the interests of Jefferson County residents and uh, the benefits that Jefferson County residents have received from the investments of both uh, home funds and CDBG funds has been uh, many fold as it relates to the projects that the Wheat Ridge Housing Authority, the Jefferson County Housing Authority, and, and many other uh, both nonprofit organizations such as Brothers Redevelopment and uh, Family Tree and other organizations have been able to uh, dutifully and rightfully and transparently use these funds in a, in a very um, uh, prudent manner. So I think that uh, the, the use of home funds and CDBG funds as, as uh, federal taxpayers uh, is uh, both a benefit and, a, and a, uh, a right as a Jefferson County resident. So I uh, would be encouraging our, our Jefferson County commissioners to uh, receive all funds that we can from the federal government to reinvest in our community as, uh, as federal taxpayers. I just asked, and the amount of money from those funds to Fruitdale was $660,000. So you can see this city really does use those those monies. Did I see Mr. Matthews? Uh, yeah, I just had a question for, for Patrick. Well, if I can go back to his manager's matter. Um, there's been a lot of rumors and a lot of TV coverage and what have you going on for the G line. Yeah. And you seem to be connected. With it. And because I know we have like a 10,000 share of viewers tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> could you dispel some rumors and start some new ones for all the folks that are watching? Sure, thank you. I should have given that update. Yeah, there's unfortunately um, a lot of different, um, I think, conversations happening um, 
And so all I can tell you is at this point, RTD does not have a date, a, a, an official date of when the G-Line's gonna open. Um, there was a, a news story on Channel 9 where um, I think a representative from RTD was, was um, kind of pushing in a corner to say that yes, it could open in 2018. So um, I think they're still hoping that it's gonna be in 2017, which no guarantee. Um, this RTD official did say on TV that when asked, could it be in 2018, he, he said yes. So, um, but the point is, there is there is no date. Um, there, they started testing on the G line. Um, I think last Wednesday. Um, it's limited testing right now. Um, and uh, but the good news is, I did talk to Dave Genova. He's the um, CEO of RTD last week, and he, um, the good news is that the Federal Railroad Administration has given them permission to a waiver to start testing. Um, so what that means is they have accepted RTD's um, path forward to um, find solutions for, for the, uh, the technology issues that they're having um, on the A-line. Um, they wouldn't let them start testing um, if, they, if they didn't have a path forward. And I think one of the rumors was too that, um, that there, is, there is no solution to this technology issue um, that was, I think, written up in the paper. Well, that was actually in a letter from Denver Transit Partners, who was actually building the line, um, and, and they, they put in a letter that um, there is no technology solution to fix this problem. I asked Dave Genova directly. I said, is this true? I sent him an email. He says, um, we don't believe that. Um, and, and again, I think to put some credence into that, um, opinion um, again if the if, if the F F Federal Railroad Administration is allowing them approved a waiver to allow them to start testing I believe that they believe that there's a solution in 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 time um, so testing is supposed to um, happen in over a 90 day period which which means if things go okay that you know it potentially could open in 2017 but there's no guarantees they don't have a date um, if if asked if it's 2018 yes that's possible it's 2019 possible, yes, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for the yes. update. I believe that's it then tonight.